Hello everyone and welcome to Cybersecurity Management. This is webinar number one. Uh, we will be covering uh, the, the broad topic of cybersecurity management in uh, this um, short course over the next four weeks. And I really look forward to giving you all a taste of uh, what that means uh, you know, as a professional and what that means as an individual or, or a member of a team. Uh, and giving you a good idea of that. My name's Jeremy Costa. Uh, I look forward to taking you all through that. I'm very passionate about this topic. I'm very excited to be telling you all uh, about uh, you know what I've learned over the years and uh, and trying to impart some of that that knowledge. And this week we're going to be uh, discussing efficient and and effective cybersecurity, which is really about the basics. And the uh, the the base of uh, the cybersecurity practice, you know, what you need to know and how to perform cybersecurity in an organisation so it is effective and efficient. Uh, now, a quick introduction into me. I've been in the IT industry about twenty years, so I'm, I'm getting kind of um, uh, uh, aged now in the in the IT industry. I see that some of the the participants have been in the IT industry longer and much longer than I have. So welcome to everyone from all backgrounds and experience levels. Uh, I've been in uh, in information security specifically for for just over ten years, and in that period, I've performed uh, security professional um, uh, the security professional. A role as well as uh, you know a, a little bit of pen testing, uh, a lot of uh, review and compliance, and a lot of uh, strategy and architecture. And I'll take you through all those disciplines as we move through these four weeks. Um, but there, I've I've had a broad range of experience, mostly in the in the telco sector, but for for large enterprise. Uh, I've got a range of qualifications. I, I was um, Collecting them at one point, oh, that's kind of slowed down now. It, it just doesn't seem to be enough time for it. But uh, yeah, I've done uh, quite a few things, CISSP, CISM, CEH, um, uh, GPEN, uh, various GAC. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, training certifications. And I also got my Master of Information Security through IT Masters uh, some uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, and uh, that was a really good experience, really um, uh, helped me to understand the importance of of uh, the skills of writing and the skills of communication, and uh, and and that he that helps you refine uh, those kinds of skills. A, a course like an IT masters. Um, I've covered my experience. Uh, it's mostly large enterprise, uh, predominantly in security teams. I've always been fascinated with security. I was actually studying marine biology at one stage, and I I dropped out of that after I worked out how to get into other people's email boxes when I was working at university. That's my, <laughs> that was my introdu introduction into information security. Don't tell anyone. I mean, <laughs> there's quite a few people in here, so um, expect that's hard to keep secret now. But um, uh, yeah, that's, I found that fascinating. Uh, and I found the whole uh, concept of the internet and being able to access other places remotely just absolutely amazing. And it, and it dawned on me that there is so much uh, possibility for things to go wrong and there is so much need to protect uh, systems and, uh, and organizations from people who wish to do harm through those systems. Uh, so I've been lecturing for IT Masters and CSU for, for four or five years. Uh, I really enjoy it. Um, I hope that uh, I can make this really exciting uh, and I can keep uh, you all energized through the whole uh, four weeks. Uh, and uh, I think it's the, the IT Masters is actually a really good program, uh, and we actually have them. Uh, we have a representative from CSU to to give you a a, um, uh, a taste of what the IT Masters course and, and a Masters course through CSU uh, would give you, and to uh, give you the rundown. So I might just pass over to Jason uh, for a little while, and he can give you that uh, rundown and that overview of uh, what that means. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much. So, hopefully, you can all hear me. Welcome along tonight to the uh, free short course from IT Masters. Um, my name is Jason Howe. I'm a course director at Charles Sturt. So, can everyone hear me okay? Can I just get a few um, hands, perhaps? Or, yes, okay, great. So, um, as Jeremy mentioned, IT Masters um, run a number of free short courses, but they also run a number of postgraduate uh, master's degrees in association with Charles Sturt University. 
So I'm from Charles Sturt and I briefly want to talk tonight about uh, some of these programs before handing back to Jeremy. So uh, Charles Sturt University is, is a regionally based Australian university. We have uh, campuses in different areas such as Bathurst, uh, Albury, Wodonga, Wagga Wagga. Chiefly we are a distance education university, one of the largest in Australia. So we have around 39,000 students enrolled, 23,000 of those are in fact distance education students. So I want to talk uh, really quickly uh, tonight uh, uh, from uh, the perspective of some of the courses that may interest you um, as, as students of, of the short course offered here through IT Masters on Security. So these are what are called postgraduate programs, so they're Masters or Graduate Certificates, so they're higher than undergraduate bachelor degrees. The three courses I want to talk about tonight, the Master of Information System Security, which um, Jeremy is a graduate of, the Master of Management IT, and a new course that we have starting up next year, the Graduate Certificate in Industry Computing. So what are some of the benefits of enrolling in these courses? Obviously these, these programs that we're talking about, they're not free, um, but they are prestigious postgraduate awards. So you, as I mentioned, one of the leading providers of distance education courses in Australia, and in fact the leading provider of IT postgraduate courses in Australia. Um, postgraduate awards are very uh, highly regarded, so it certainly can help your career and um, employment prospects. These courses that I'm going to talk about are all designed to be studied part-time by distance education, by people working as busy professionals. Um, all of it is online, uh, a very interactive environment, um, and you can complete these programs relatively quickly. You can study uh, across three sessions, which mean you can complete a master's part-time in around about two years. There are also pathway options for people with industry experience but who do not have an undergraduate degree. So uh, the Master of Information Systems Security is the first one I want to uh, quickly highlight. It's a 12 subject masters. It's uh, consisting of eight core subjects and a number of elective subjects. So I guess what's uh, distinguishing about this Masters is many of the subjects, first of all, uh, are offered through IT Masters and through lecturers like Jeremy, but many of the subjects as well are based around specific industry certifications. So you can see on the right hand side there some of the elective subjects, uh, ITE 512 Incident Response, that's based around the, the GAC Certified Incident Handler Certification. Uh, forensic investigation, the subject under that is based on the Computer Hacking Forensic Investigator Cert from EC Council. So they're very much um, designed around industry certification content uh, intended for people who are working in the industry and who want to uh, get a postgraduate master's award. So that's the Master of IT. We have another one called the Master of Management Information Technology. Typically this course, another 12 subject masters, is more for people who are working in a technical role and looking to move into or have currently moved into a management role, moving away from technology into management. It have a, has a heavy focus on, on management context, uh, co content as well as allowing you to specialise in different industry areas such as IT security, project management and networking. Um, you can see their core subjects around the topics of uh, human resource management, change management, strategy. Um, there's a subject there on IT service quality management which looks at the alignment of IT with business through the, the lens of the ISO uh, 20,000 certification scheme. It also allows you through these specialisations to get your fix of, of technical subjects in a specific uh, area. Another course I want to briefly draw your attention to is the Graduate Certificate in Industry Computing. Uh, that's a four subject course, it's, it's being released from 2016, quite a, an exciting course because essentially it allows you to design your own program um, based on what interests you as a student. So you could choose to take a couple of subjects there that might deal with iOS app development, one might deal with cloud computing, another might deal with incident response, allowing you to put together a degree of your own choosing um, that can later be used as well as a pathway and credit into master's programs. Okay, so quickly, where do master's and graduate certificates fit in the academic hierarchy? In terms of uh, university courses, undergraduate sit, uh, courses sit at the bottom, 
Um, masters uh, is is sort of right at the top, just below doctorate, which is sort of the PhD. Um, grad cert and graduate diploma are typically uh, shortened versions of masters courses. They do allow a pathway into masters programs. Getting into these uh, programs, um, there, there are three main pathways. One is if you have an undergraduate degree in either a related discipline or an unrelated discipline and you do have some industry experience in addition to that. So these programs are designed for people who, who know what they're doing in the industry. Alternatively, if you have industry experience at least three years plus in a relatively senior role but don't have a undergraduate degree, we can allow you into the program through a graduate certificate pathway. And what that means, you can see on the screen there that uh, a graduate certificate is essentially nested within the masters. So we enrol you into a grad cert, you do the four subjects within that. If you don't have an undergraduate degree, you can then move from the graduate certificate to the masters and carry all of those subjects as credit, leaving eight subjects to get your masters. So under that scenario, for essentially 12 subjects, you're getting two awards. So in terms of uh, what it's like to study as a distance student with Charles Cert, I guess this, this course is an example of some of the technologies that are regularly used. So everything is, is pretty much online. You can transact the whole degree online. We have regular webinars, forums, blogs within our interact uh, learning environments for each subject that allow you to connect with the lecturer, with other students. All assignment submissions are online. Um, study modules um, and materials are put online by the lecturer uh, and indeed we have a fairly large uh, library and subscription to uh, e-books and e-journals. There are no residential inquiry, uh, requirements, so as I said, the whole thing can be done online as a distance education student. There are a few people asking about prices, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, flexibility is another key feature of these programs, so you can um, increase the number of subjects that you do. So for a master's you've got 12 subjects. Typically you would do that in two years, uh, but there's nothing stopping you from fast tracking by doing more subjects in a session and potentially completing a master's program in a year. Um, you can also slow track. Uh, you can take leaves of absence. You can cut down the number of subjects that you study. It really depends on what fits uh, with your, your current lifestyle. Uh, lifestyle and your the busyness around work and family of course. You can also exit programs early and frequently there is a, a lower award that you can graduate from. In terms of time commitment, each subject that you would do at CSU is, is designed so it takes around about 10 hours per week of commitment uh, per unit. So you're doing two subjects in a, in a session, you would be looking at around about 20 hours per week that you would need to find in order to get through those units. But there's a lot of support, um, a lot of interaction, and it really is an enjoyable experience. It's, it's, it's not a grind. A lot of, most of the subjects are a lot of fun. Um, credit, people have mentioned um, recognition of prior learning. Um, now, I've actually got an error there. Undergraduate study completed in the IT discipline is not uh, something that we recognise for credit. Uh, we can allow you to substitute units if you do have undergraduate study in a similar area. Really what we recognise for credit is either industry certification or previous postgraduate study. We don't give credit for work experience. Uh, work experience allows you to get into the program. So in terms of uh, costs from 2016, um, Australian and New Zealand students $3,000 per subject. Um, for international students studying by distance education, $3,100 per subject. All of the textbook costs are included in that uh, price. Um, there's also a small uh, student services and amenities fee per subject of around about $30, $36. Okay, you could be eligible to actually defer um, your payment uh, of, of subject fees through our government fee help loan as well. So if there are any concerns around the price there, um, fee help is a possible option. And indeed, if you're using this as part of the, your, your education for your career, uh, it, it could indeed be tax deductible. Um, if you do have any more questions uh, about the program, I don't want to detract too much from Jeremy's presentation, please give me, uh, drop me a line. Uh, I'm the course director, Jay Howe, at csu.edu.au. Um, if you want to find the IT Masters contact, particularly around questions dealing with industry certification, neil.mcosh at itmasters.edu.au. 
We also have an eligibility survey, so if you don't want to apply but want to find out first whether you're eligible or not, there's a URL there up on the screen that will allow you to uh, basically type in information and find out whether you're eligible for the program and indeed how much credit you will get for the program. For those who are really uh, keen, you can, you can apply directly with the URL on the screen. Okay, so thanks very much there for my brief session. I'll hand back to Jeremy now to, to continue with the presentation and please, if you do have any questions uh, around um, any of the courses I've spoken about tonight, please do get in touch. Okay. Um, thanks, Jason. Jeremy. Much appreciated. I can vouch for the, uh, the, the, the quality and the, um, the benefit of doing such courses uh, went through mine and uh, I think it seriously uh, seasoned me as a, as a well-rounded information security uh, professional and later into a security manager. It, it allows you to, to also have the credentials on your, your, um, uh, your resume and your CV uh, to impress uh, uh, future um, employers. So that's great. So let's let's move into the uh, cybersecurity management course. Uh, thank you all for um, for uh, dialing in, and also for those who have already started to uh, send me messages on LinkedIn. Uh, I will uh, connect uh, with um, with people on LinkedIn if they like. Uh, just make sure if you do an invitation um, to make sure you say uh, it's from the MOOC, so I know it's not just uh, any random person. Uh, so it's one of the the intimate crowd of 500 uh, or 600 that we have in the uh, in the uh, webinar now. Okay, let's dive into it. It's always good to have more contacts in information security. So happy to be that that point as well. Okay, so this is GoToWebinar. Uh, we're on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Uh, thanks, everyone, for turning up uh, uh, right on time. Uh, we are going to have uh, some lively discussions, and we encourage you to have that in the forum. Uh, there's already some good discussions and some good uh, agreements and disagreements with uh, various articles. Uh, it's really important that we uh, generate that discussion. It's the way we hone uh, our uh, perspective on things. Uh, if you're always just taking one side or you're only considering one side, then it's not a well-balanced view. So it really uh, important. We've got some weekly homework, which I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, your answers to these evolve. And also, we've got a, a bit of a technical uh, uh, homework uh, piece in the second week, which I'm really looking forward to in and how you all help each other through that. Uh, I've provided some minimal information to kind of um, uh, get you up and running, uh, but it really is uh, supposed to test how you investigate and get a system up and uh, get information into a system. So I'm really looking forward to that. We'll also have some weekly discussion questions there at the end of this this um, live session uh, on these slides. Uh, there is an exam at the end. I think it's going to be 40 multiple choice. Uh, we uh, that that should be um, good fun to do, and hopefully I'll give you all of the knowledge for that to pass that uh, fairly easily. Uh, well, not easily, but a little bit challenging. But you know, test your your knowledge that you've um, uh, that you've acquired. Uh, all uh, inquiries and questions for course topics, you can send them into the the questions. I can. Uh, we'll stop. Uh, I think halfway through, um, uh, Margie. We'll stop halfway through, and we'll uh, we'll answer some questions. Then we'll answer some questions at the end as well. Uh, so we'll just have two two moments for that, and I'll make sure I, I stop then. Um, and obviously, there is uh, speak to the the administrative staff. There is a couple of administrative staff in this. Uh, in this, there's Margie, and and um, she can help you with um, with anything that you need, any questions or uh, pointers or URLs that you might have missed or something like that. Okay, so security management, um, uh, cyber security management is about uh, protecting an organisation from cyber security threats holistically okay it's everything that we 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 do to make sure that that doesn't happen and there are some gray areas that fit into that responsibility and there is uh, also some very clear cut responsibilities in there uh, i think in in its essence is about identifying and addressing risk okay and that means risk of the cybersecurity type now if you're going to do that um, and get into a position of doing that, you do need a, uh, 
are likely to need a couple of certifications. Uh, recruiters and businesses like to know that those who they're employing to do this role are qualified enough. And the, the kind of top three leadership or security leadership uh, certifications that are out there, which this uh, this cybersecurity uh, manager course kind of uh, management course, it does align um, fairly well to them, is the CISM, the ISSMP, and the GSLC. The CISM is from Osaka. This is probably the best known information security management um, uh, course uh, and certification. It's kind of the de facto standard, much like CISSP is for, for information security professionals. Uh, it focuses on security governance, risk management, and security program, and we'll cover those things in, in this course. And But the exam focuses on, on decision makers and business goals, okay? So ASAC is very good. Uh, their, their courses, the COBIT, is very good at trying to understand or trying to give people the the ability to understand what the board of directors and what the executive team uh, wish to gain from the security team or, or IT teams as well. Uh, so so that's their, their kind of focus, which is really good. And it gives you that understanding of, of securities there for the business, not in spite of the business. So that's, that's a really important thing. Uh, there's also the IC squared security management, ISSMP, that builds on the CISSP. SP. It's got five domains, kind of similar to the SISM. Uh, they do organize it differently, but I'd suggest that's good on it. I haven't done that. I have done the SISM. Uh, and the, the final one, the, the GX Cybersecurity Leadership. The, now, I see this as more of a, uh, it's got a good technical base as well. It covers all of those technical pitfalls that you might find as a security practitioner and then also uh, draws on a lot of management topics as well and uh, is really uh, a, a good balance uh, and uh, if I were um, uh, doing my uh, security management uh, certifications again I might even actually consider that one to, to go forward. There are some other ones from Osaka which really help in this area. The, the C risk is very good. Uh, there is um, uh, also, uh, the GIAC ones for incident handling are, are very good, the, the SANS courses. Uh, so it's, there's, there's an absolute plethora of them. Uh, one of the exercises we're going to do uh, after the, the live sessions is actually, I think it's the third live session or the fourth, uh, we, we will actually try and decide on certifications for various professionals and various skill sets that we want in our teams, okay? So, so we will do an investigation uh, and, and you will put uh, your uh, like top certifications and, and skills that you believe that the various team members would need in different disciplines. And you'll see what that means a little bit later on. Now on to the next slide. All right. So the... Um, uh, the cybersecurity manager. So there's this guy or girl in the uh, organization who's responsible for, for protecting the organization. Uh, what do they need to do? Well, they need a good technical understanding. This is not foremost and most important. There are a lot of uh, cybersecurity managers or security managers or CISOs or head of, heads of security that do not... Um, necessarily come from a technical background, but they do need a good understanding of what the risks are and to be able to uh, evaluate uh, the likelihood and impact of certain things uh, happening. Now, I think that that comes best from having a good IT network background. And my strategy as a, uh, through my career was for the first uh, 10 years of my career to really get a good broad understanding of IT and network technology and then move into security. Uh, that, that was my approach and there certainly is the opportunity to backfill as well. I come from a, an IT support background so I went through desktop, um, server, network support um, and that gave me a, a really good uh, feel now for, for what threats uh, are uh, imposed on the organization. So that's also, I often say that cybersecurity is a discipline that moves as fast as all the other technology disciplines put together. You think of cloud, databases, web applications, uh, um, BYOD, uh, desktops, uh, virtualization, uh, virtual networking. Uh, you think of all of those things and they all move very 
quickly. They're, they're all developing at a rapid pace and the organization wants to make use of them. The challenge for the cybersecurity practitioner and cybersecurity manager is to understand as those technologies develop uh, that uh, what the risks are to, in using those technologies. Uh, the cybersecurity manager has to be disciplined and creative. They have to persist with the routine tasks that may appear mundane. There's always boring tasks in any job. Um, you know, there, there, there is the tasks that you have to do r repeatedly and are, uh, you know, serious brain work but don't have a very uh, exciting outcome. Um, just try explaining, if you're in security or in IT, just try explaining what you do in any technical depth in a uh, uh, at a party or a barbecue, you'll, you'll find eyes glazing over. Uh, but it's important to uh, to keep uh, up with those tasks. Uh, a lot of security uh, and cybersecurity and managing cybersecurity is following up on what uh, people said they would do. Uh, when all the, the chaos reigns and everyone says, yes, we need to do that to address risk. But then when the dust settles, who goes back and makes sure that those things were put in place? Or who goes in then and checks to make sure things are still in place? So that's that's a really important thing. And these, that's where a lot of these security issues uh, come from. Um, there's also a requirement to accurately identify future threats. So where so this has two elements to it. One, where is the business going and changing so that it might it be introduced to new threats? And two, where is the industry and the threat landscape going where it might introduce new threats to the business? Okay, so that's uh, having an understanding from both perspectives. The cybersecurity manager provides advice where guidance is sought by the business. They're trying to do something to create a new product. They come to you, they say, is this going to be secure? You need to think about it at, at, at all levels, uh, at as many levels as you can. Uh, you know, how is the, the system architected? How is the product that the system uh, relies on architected? How is access control performed? Uh, does it uh, meet uh, standards uh, or internal policies? And uh, finally, uh, can we test it to make sure that the security is uh, not um, uh, being compromised in some way? Um, uh, the, uh, you know, and that's all about uh, identifying gaps as well. The cybersecurity manager is a communicator, and, and this might be one of the most important uh, aspects of a cybersecurity manager, being able to explain in uh, everyday terms uh, what a threat and a risk is and what the potential for loss to the organization is to the organizational assets is one of the, the most crucial skills of the cybersecurity manager. Uh, we will uh, go through the concept of threat scenarios. Uh, I've got a very clear uh, picture of what threat scenarios should look like and I'd like to convey that to you guys as a formula to being able to speak to the business. And, and, and I encourage you when you're explaining why a business should not do something or close a particular security gap or to implement a certain security control, the threat scenario is your biggest weapon. And we will uh, go through that um, uh, as the, uh, in, in this live session, actually. Um, and finally, they, the, the communicator is, is not a very good communicator without excellent verbal and written communication skills. Now, I put written in there as well, but uh, I, I think um, uh, they, they I, I don't put that in as a lesser item. I actually think commu written communication skills may be even more important than verbal communication skills. If you've ever seen a report or you've been delivered a report from a internal person that is not very well constructed and very difficult to follow and you can't really understand it, it undermines your confidence in that person and the team they work in. Cybersecurity is no different. If you if you uh, deliver something that is not of a professional quality into the business, it undermines the trust that the biz business has in you and, and the team. So I cannot stress enough how important it is to have good written skills and also verbal skills. Uh, and, and that's uh, it not only expresses a clear uh, thought process, but also enables the audience to understand uh, what the real threats are and what the risks are, and then they can make the decision to address it or not. All right.
I'm going to get on my soapbox a few times in this uh, live session. I hope that's okay. Um, I will um, <laughs> continue on to the next slide. All right. So, so we're in an organization where the cybersecurity manager, congratulations, welcome to the organization. What do you need to look out for? What, what is the enterprise, uh, what is the landscape the enterprise is sitting in? Uh, do they have uh, various products and services uh, and what are the threats to those? So increasingly we, we are faced with a world that is more connected and that is exactly the same for business. Everything needs to talk to each other and that means that uh, con controlling and restricting access to information gets very difficult and it becomes quite complex. Partners are interconnected. Um, Staff have connection to all sorts of systems, um, handling their accounts, uh, making sure that systems aren't actually connected to the internet when they're not supposed to be, you know, to the broader public community where they can be attacked. Uh, that gets very difficult. And the business is screaming for it because the more they're connected, the more they can sell, the more they can, can, they can publicize themselves, the more they can interact with the world. It's just natural that the business will be more connected. And it's not to say that cybersecurity is to draw that back and to hold that back, but cybersecurity's role is to try and allow them to be as connected as they need to be for their business without restricting the business, but keeping it and doing it in a safe manner. And that's that's really key, is that the business wants to do that. They've got to make money. They they Otherwise, the business will not exist. They've got to grow, and we have to be sympathetic to that cause. And that means we have executives who are focused on the business. They're focused on the bottom line. They're focused on the health of the business, the governance of the business, and they don't have time for technical explanations. They don't have time to dive into a textbook and find out what SQL injection is. They don't have time to dive into uh, a, a website and find out what is the difference between a publicly accessible address and an, and an internal address. They, they need that explained to them in practical terms. We also have board members who demand results. I mean, which board member doesn't? And if they don't, they're probably not doing their, their, their utmost to keep the, the business running. Uh, that is only natural as well. They need to have things done within the organization that makes money for the business and keeps the shareholders happy. Now, there may be, you know, there's a lot of criticism in business for, for change of tact and change of, of, of uh, strategy and not knowing what comes next and different priorities. But if you can be the cybersecurity manager that allows the business to work in that way and you are flexible enough to keep them safe while doing that, that is the ultimate goal. Uh, can, there are organizations that are more difficult than others and less regulated, but that is a, a really important part of the, the cybersecurity manager um, uh, role. We also have staff who are susceptible to malicious attacks. Uh, <laughs> even the most careful staff sometimes fall for the tricks. Uh, the recent emails going around saying you have a scanned document coming from the Xerox MFC, uh, that looks plain and simply a legitimate email. Uh, those scanner emails look all kind of plain text anyway. So when they come in like that, uh, it's really, um, uh, it, they're susceptible to opening it up and there's a virus inside and then they, whatever they have access to, the bad guys now have access to. Now we also have uh, phishing attacks and, and uh, the crypto locker attacks where they're targeting residential and, and, and customers and end up sometimes in businesses as well. But these things we need to, to understand that, that staff and the frontline people who are dealing uh, with day-to-day -day work are susceptible to these malicious attacks and that will never end. The whole process of awareness is a leaky bucket uh, to provide the, the understanding to, the, to the, the staff members. You can get them to a certain level and then you have to refresh it and refresh it and refresh it. So it's periodic training and awareness. We also have technology that is increasing with depth and diversity. Uh, this could, could have been the point number one because this is uh, one of the biggest challenges of being uh, an, a, an organization or being a cybersecurity manager. Um, is that all the technology rushing into the organization, the different things that are, that are being put in place to make the organization successful, very difficult. 
Um, and then there's also software that is constantly vulnerable. And this is the risks that pose every enterprise. Every enterprise has software that is vulnerable. I don't know any enterprise, unless it's just a, a one-man band who patches his own stuff, who is always on the ball with their vulnerability management. Uh, there is, it is a risk management process of addressing the high risks first and uh, then uh, addressing those that are less risky uh, in due time. On to the next slide. Sounds pretty scary, the enterprise landscape. <laughs> so let's go on to what is at stake. So what happens when it all goes wrong? What happens when we, your organization ends up in the paper uh, or ends up in the mainstream press for something serious? Um, means it's a loss of brand and reputation, even if it's just a, uh, something that um, uh, is only for a subset of users or customers, um, then you know, it only impacts a subset, then it's still a loss of brand and reputation. Uh, word travels fast and, and it's, it's really uh, often the, the organization, especially if they're a retail or, or, or residential-faced organization, lives and dies on its brand and reputation. Sometimes you're a you're less exposed organization, but you still have a reputation to your partners. You'll be servicing some business that... And, and you'll have customers who are businesses that rely on your reputation to keep, keep them safe as well. Uh, and that's really important. Whereas you may have a loss of revenue and customers because of that brand and reputation, um, it, is a, um, uh, it is an actual fact that that happens. We saw massive losses for, for Target Corp. Uh, there was a classic case of a... a, a um, uh, a company called Card Systems that went out of business, one of the first kind of public uh, ones to, to, for that to happen, um, and that's a big deal. Uh, there is increased scrutiny when something like this happens. You'll be audited by various groups. Uh, certain regulators might ask you to be audited. Uh, certain um, uh, maybe even uh, banks might ask you to be audited or PCI. Uh, things like that. So there will be increased scrutiny if you have some sort of breach or some sort of incident. There's no question about it. Uh, and it and it comes at a cost. Uh, there will be maybe fines and penalties, maybe from privacy commissioner or maybe from uh, industry regulators, uh, other industry regulators, or maybe even, um, again, card brands uh, or things like that. Uh, there's also a personal cost for the team. When something happens like this, all tools are down and everyone's working on trying to minimize the damage and to close off the issue. Uh, and, and that uh, is not a, a small thing. Not only is it taxing for the team to go through that, but it's also, uh, it can be quite demoralizing. Uh, certainly, if you're a part of an organization that has experienced this, then, then that could be a, a bit of an issue. Um, it's also at a professional cost for the cybersecurity manager. Uh, that is, it is no question that you feel the responsibility of these things when you're a cybersecurity manager, and it feels like a race against time. You're trying to implement as many protection mechanisms uh, and to test as many things as possible to give you peace of mind. And that, again, that is a constant process. That doesn't stop. It is. It, the, the organization is shifting and changing and you have to test and review along with it. And it's a big task. It's a massive task. And often security teams are not resourced to do that, but also uh, it, 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 there needs to be a balance between the cost of the security team uh, to the business and the risk addressed. So the idea is to address as much risk as possible. And if there is a still major risks not addressed, then maybe you need to put your hand up for uh, more resources. Okay, so that's what's at stake. That's what's at stake with the cybersecurity manager. And we jump on to uh, the threat landscape. Um, so we've had the, the, the enterprise comes into an organization, sorry, the organization is in a landscape of, of, of you know, uh, lots of different avenues and ways of being attacked. This is how they're attacked. Uh, there is not a business out there these days that doesn't have international exposure. You look at them, they've got a website, they've got email, uh, they, they are exposed and they want to be. They need to sell their products. They need to be known about. Uh, when you search for a product, they're hoping 
their site comes up and is selected by you, um, whether you're a business or an individual. Uh, it means that the attackers also have anonymity. If you're internationally exposed, you have attackers all around the globe who are interested in getting to your assets. And, and in the first homework and in, in the first uh, uh after this live session, I'm um, hoping you're, you're all working on that, you'll put yourself in the attacker's shoes. You'll, you'll look at where they are around the world and what is of interest in a business. And that's how you've got to think as a cybersecurity manager is to really think about, uh, and a cybersecurity practitioner, is think about what they want out of your business. What do they want? What would be valuable to them? And put yourself in those shoes. That's a, it's a really important um, uh, exercise to do on a regular basis. We also have this idea of automate, automization and weaponization. So some brilliant person comes up with a, a, a way to subvert a access control or a security control because they've dived into the source code, understood it, and then posted an exploit, which is a easy way for somebody else to take it and use it who doesn't know anything about source code, can't even code. But then that's called weaponization, but they can then use that at their will and then that spreads. So we live in this environment where it just takes one brilliant person to figure out a vulnerability, write an exploit, and then it can spread and then be automated. Um, you think about Conficker. Uh, it was a, 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 a bug or, a, or an exploit, sorry, a vulnerability in, um, in the Microsoft network stack, in the SMB or SIFS. Uh, network in the, in the networking, and uh, it was probably very difficult to find. It was a late one. It's it's kind of been the last one, the last big wormable network stack virus uh, for Windows, um, but it was put into a virus and could actually worm it around. That's automation and weaponization right there, and that was devastating for a lot of organizations. It brought systems down um, and is still around. It is still around in legacy environments. You'll You'll uh, see it when people, uh, if you've got BYOD in an organization, I've seen this in previous organizations where people bring their laptops unbeknowns into their home laptops into work and they plug in and, and the alarms are raised because their, their machine's trying to infect other machines. Uh, and most likely uh, the machines that, uh, that are out there uh, on your corporate network aren't impacted by this anymore but it is it is quite the point is that this weaponization automa automation is actually very powerful and, and difficult to protect against we also have commodi commoditization of cyber crime actors uh, this means that it is not just one guy out there trying to make money it is gangs gangs who uh, are particularly well funded from previous exploits they then hire developers to write them malicious code. They then hire hackers to get them into systems and to fish people. They then have mules to, to uh, uh, process money for them and to do money laundering. They then also use botnets and zombies uh, to uh, send masses of spam and to avoid blacklist it, blacklists and things like that. And, and then there are the... These gangs are the organizers that orchestrate all of this and, and allow it to happen. And it is refined. It is not kind of just teenagers anymore. The cyber uh, crime actors are aware that it is a, a money-making exercise and they are interested and, and they're not letting up uh, because there's a lot of money to be made. And so it is, a, uh, it is um, going to hold their interest for a while. And I'm going to the next slide. So these attackers, who are they? So I talked about the cybercrime, the funded criminals here in, in the external uh, where my cursor is. Uh, they are uh, definitely active. We see them all the time. Uh, we have internal attackers as well. Not only do we have uh, people who are disgruntled and want to leave a mess um, and, and uh, addict, have some sort of addiction that they, they need to um, uh, to, uh, like to gambling or, or to to drugs that they need to fund uh, through fraud, but we also just have accidental and inadvertent things. You know, we have people who download a database, look at it on their computer, and then accidentally send it out to someone to the competitor, or or, or load it up onto Dropbox with a with an open um, uh, sharing um, 
setting, you know, something like that. There, there is just accidental and inadvertent things as well. The external, the, sorry, <laughs> the external actors, these are the funded criminals that we talked about. State-sponsored agents are a real thing these days. Um, we see it with some of the the um, the, the reports from um, the antivirus company that, that escapes me right now. Uh, the Russian one. Anyway, I'm sure someone said it. <laughs> uh, Kaspersky. Yeah, we've seen some of the the uh, the, the reports from there. We've seen uh, other reports. We all know of Stuxnet. Uh, they, these things are real. Uh, we all know of the the Mandiant report uh, about the the Chinese attackers. Uh, they they're not make believe. There are state sponsored agents, and why wouldn't they? It's low risk. Uh, it's high gain, and they're interested in the information. We also have activists. They're still around. These guys uh, like to make a point. Uh, we've got anonymous. Uh, we also do still have board teams uh, and people who big note themselves. They are still around. Uh, we've got a few. Uh, I've got a few breaches over the years here as an example. Um, I'll just run through them quickly. But the idea is to give you a taste of what can and does happen. I mean, you've all seen. I'm sure the breaches in the news uh, with with various organisations uh, it's it's kind of a regular event uh, and and it, and it doesn't seem to go away. So, but it's been um, you know a long time. So I run through a couple of these uh, in 2013. This is one of my favourite breaches of all time. Uh, there was a TV station in Great Falls, Montana. Um, their emergency alert system was hacked um, and it published uh, the, a a broadcast of a uh, a story of dead bodies rising from the grave. And some people actually thought this was true. And it was more of a joke, but it actually goes to show not only do we need to keep these systems safe for monetary pol uh, uh, reasons, but also because uh, we, um, uh, you know, people are still duped by these things. They actually cause a lot of fright. So uh, quite interesting. In August 2013, we had uh, Adobe. Uh, it's getting a bit old now, but they had uh, quite a large amount of customer records. Um, they have uh, malware analysis, uh, and uh, and and they used uh, various uh, investigation techniques. Uh, you know, finding um, different pieces to to work out how they got inside, uh, and then they went through a big um, uh, password reset um, uh, uh, activity, which is a good idea. We then had Target Corp, which is kind of like the de facto. We use this in the IT Masters course as a bit of a case study. It's because it's got kind of everything you want in a in a breach because there's all the steps and it's been made quite public. Uh, they had 110 million customer records. They had malware on their POS terminals and they and it all came through a VPN access from a from a partner's environment. So there's all sorts of lessons in there um, and uh, the incident response to that. Uh, I believe um, they are uh, have turned around completely and are, and are basically a, a cyber security center of excellence now. And I think this is a good way to go where they've made an example to say, look how much you can turn it around. And I would say that they are a, a, a really good uh, shining light of cyber security now. Uh, in May 2014, eBay had a, a, a big hack with uh, passwords. My password was in there, interestingly enough. So that that um, I went through a password reset process, 145 million customer details, a small number of employee login credentials as well. Uh, and then we've just recently had David Jones and Kmart as well locally. So, and that's domestic, um, uh, the domestic outfits. And they... Um, they uh, apparently, according to the, the press, they had a vulnerability in WebSphere uh, that allowed them to come in. And that's just one vulnerability. And I'm sure they've got fairly uh, robust vulnerability management uh, processes. And it's a shame that, that this happened to them. It, um, um, it's disappointing, um, certainly for those involved. Um, and I would say that it, it, it's hard to make sure that everything is patched up to date all the time. Um, so, you know, the that's only speculation from the newspaper, but um, it just goes to show how difficult it is to stay on top of those vulnerabilities. Okay, so there are the breaches. Heading off into the next slide. Um, now, we just need to qualify some terms for those of you who haven't been working in security for some time. We'll run through this fairly quickly. We have a threat. This is actions or events that have a potential to negatively impact organizational assets. Okay, that's a threat. 
So what is a threat to an organization? It is actually something that occurs or is threatened to occur. That's the whole dear idea of a threat. So uh, it, 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 it's a potential, okay? So um, uh, we then have a vulnerability. This is a weakness in a system or asset uh, that might allow some unauthorized access or allow uh, uh, unauthorized changes or allow for someone to uh, uh, bring something down or make unavailable in an unauthorized manner as well. So it's all about um, uh, bypassing controls and being able to do something you shouldn't be able to do uh, and making the system weaker for it. An exploit is a method of making use of that weakness to access an asset, right? So the vulnerability is nothing on its own unless it's exploited. When it's exploited, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, the risk has been realized. Now, we also have a risk assessment. Uh, so when you're in an organization and you're being the cybersecurity manager, you'll do this on a daily basis. You assess risk, you determine what the risk is by understanding the asset, and then you manage the risk. And then after you've managed the risk, you might have some residual risk as well. So residual risk is the risk left over after you've put in some mitigating controls. Um, I, I think the residual risk uh, is good to know about uh, and good to uh, term, uh, and, and it's quite uh, kind of classic cybersecurity. But I would say when you're explaining it to the, uh, the executives, a certain risk, I would say you leave that term residual risk out and just say we are addressing most of the risk this way, which means the risk becomes uh, low now or medium, you know, rather than a high or critical. Okay, so that's that's just my tip there. Um, it seems to be um, addressed or it seems to be understood easier. Here's some more terms. Risk itself is a combination of likelihood and impact, and that's what you really got to think. Uh, when someone comes to you and says, hey, this is a problem, you think, what is the risk? And you think about impact. And to understand the impact, you have to answer a question. What is the asset? If there is no asset, is there an impact? And is the asset informational asset? Is it a, is it a, a system asset, like the availability of the system? Is it a privileged function? What is the impact if that asset is damaged in some way? And then you have to think, well, if that asset is damaged, what is the likelihood of it being damaged? Are there other mitigating controls? Is it something that's plausible? Is it something that's easily um, perpetrated or is it uh, really difficult to actually do? Is there, there a combination of or a series of events that need to occur for that to happen? Now, this is not something you walk into a building with or you walk into the profession with straight off the bat. You don't know the organizational assets. You can have an idea, but you don't quite know exactly what the organization uh, holds dear and relies upon. So understanding the assets is one of those important things you have to do when you arrive at an organization. Now, the, the, the likelihood factor is also another uh, thing that comes with understanding the organization because you don't know what controls they have in unless you've been there for a while and then you've asked the right questions. So likelihood and impact is better assessed off the cuff when you have a good understanding of the organization. When you're assessing likelihood and impact, then you should, all, should also check it with the technical resources and with the business owner. The technical resources to understand the likelihood and the business owner to understand the impact because you're talking about the asset. All right, I think we covered that uh, at length. All right, so Margie, we might answer a few questions. I'm looking at the time. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go slightly over. We might answer a few questions. Is that right? We've got a few more slides after this. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just currently scrolling through. There have okay. been a couple sorry. here. I've caught you yeah. off guard. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> David Gordon um, has just asked, um, to qualify risk and then damage to an asset, is it best to, sorry, is it best practice to have a broad categorization in place for all assets, data and risk, sorry, risk, sorry, data and systems to make this risk assessment easier? A broad categorization, yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, this commonly comes in like an information um, uh, classification policy. 
Um, but also, uh, I would uh, hesitate just to make it about information. I see assets as having uh, two main categories. One is information, and the other one is a privilege function. Uh, and you should be able to uh, describe the value of the information by not only its quality, but also its quantity. Obviously, someone uh, a single record of a very sensitive uh, database may not be as sensitive as the entire database. So, so think about the quality of the asset in, in those terms, not just information, but also privilege function. And what I mean by privilege function may be an administrator interface to a system. If you provide unauthorized unauthor access to that system in a, in a, uh, uh, in a, um, uh, to, to someone who's not supposed to have it, then they may be able to do things to that system that you don't want them to do. Uh, and you think about assets in that, that sense as well. It's not just about the information, it's also about the availability or the, the um, integrity of the system as well. So yeah, a broad categorization of assets is good. Like a, I would say, you know, uh, you might have, a, for, for information, you might have public information, confidential information, and, and really, really confidential information and super secret information or something like that. But it depends on how your business is operating. If they're used to having many classifications, then, then you can do that as well. Um, I hope I've answered the question. Can you tell if I've answered the question, Maggie, from, from was it David? Um, uh, David hasn't said anything since. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> yep. No, David says it's great. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Shall we take yep, one more? Uh, so, yep. Um, how about, uh, oh, sorry, I have to scroll up and go to webinars. Um, question function is not great. Um, can the residual risk turn into a threat at any stage? Yeah, absolutely. So even if you have controls in place uh, to mitigate the majority of a risk, uh, maybe it's not a complete um, uh, risk mitigation. And, and that's usually the case. So you put in uh, a, a really good example is antivirus. So you want to protect against virus, you put in antivirus, and it by no means is a complete protection because obviously there are zero-day viruses that antivirus doesn't know about. So that is still a threat. But what you've done is you've minimized the, the risk to an acceptable level. Uh, you might then go on to apply another control that means you can't execute you know, you put whitelisting on the on the PC and you can't execute in certain folders or something like that. Um, obviously, you need to execute somewhere. So there's still a risk, you know, of but that and there's still a threat. So, yeah, the, so risks definitely have corresponding threats. Uh, otherwise, they're not really uh, a risk, I guess. But uh, residual risks still do pose some threats. But the idea is to make sure that you're mitigating enough to an acceptable risk. And acceptable, I mean... Uh, to the appetite of the business to risk. Some businesses like to, you know, uh, field a lot of risk and 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 not really uh, be too concerned about having an incident and say, oh, we'll mop it up and, and we'll deal with it when it happens. Some like to button it down really tight and not have much residual risk at all. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that sounds cool. good. Great. All right, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so... One really important thing for cybersecurity management, I don't think too many uh, certifications really focus on this, but being able to communicate with the executive team and build a rapport with the executive team is key. When you have a, an incident occurring that is an impact to the business, one of the first people to have uh, it escalated to them is the line of management all the way up to the executive. Now, if you've not heard about it by then, you certainly want your ex the executive team to be forwarding these issues onto you for, for dealing with it. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a really important thing there, and that's all about trust and them having confidence in what you can do to address this risk. Uh, we want to make sure that we are concise with the executive team. We have accurate summaries. Uh, we validate our... our uh, our statistics and terms and technical details to make sure it backs up what we are saying in, in basic terms. And this means, again, making sure we have good writing quality. There's nothing worse than, than an executive looking at a summary of what's occurred and not understanding it because uh, there's such bad, uh, you know, there's bad grammar and spelling and, and, and that would undermine. Uh, and, and it seems silly because it, what if there's, what if it's understandable, 
um, but it's not very well put together, then surely it's doing a good job too. Well, I would say it may be communicating something, but the executive can't help but think that or can't help but lose a bit of confidence in the person it's coming from. Uh, so it's really important to get that writing quality. And, and it sounds pedantic, but but I've seen it uh, time and time again where the quality is, is really important for building trust and the, uh, and the uh, confidence in the executive team. Uh, the executive is interested in the ent- enterprise's needs. It, they're interested in the organization thriving, and you have to talk about the threats in those terms. How do they uh, address threats to their organization? What is important for them to get addressed? So uh, think about it, uh, and, and really it's about putting yourself in their, in their shoes. Uh, this is about uh, also having organizational uh, awareness. Uh, so you're not just communicating with the executive, you're communicating with the organization as a whole. They need to know what the threats are and how to uh, conduct themselves in a secure manner. Uh, this means constant education. And we're not only managing upwards, we're managing sidewards and downwards as well. Uh, cyber security covers the entire organization. Even if you're embedded in a, in a small area maybe of the finance team or if you're in the HR team or the administrative team or even if you're in the in you know directly into the the CTO or CIO um, you are always managing around you because you rely on other people in the organization to achieve your objectives for the business and that is one of the key things the communication and collaboration is is key and I think the next slide is one of my favorite so, uh, so the um, so following on from that, if you communicate well, then you build trust, and trust is the the key um, to uh, to making it as a cybersecurity manager and a cybersecurity team member. Uh, it is your most valuable currency in the organisation. If you think about a organisation that doesn't trust its cybersecurity team. The cybersecurity team is basically bypassed and dysfunctional. You might as well not be there. If they're putting in equipment and they're not talking to you about it or they're having incidents and they're dealing with it themselves and they're, because they don't want to deal with you because they don't trust you or, they don't, or it's not pleasant tr- dealing with you, then you are losing the game. You're, you're, it is, it is, you, it's, a, um, it's a lost cause. We need to be customer-focused as security professionals which means you need to put yourself in the shoe of the customer, shoes of the customer, not just one shoe, and try and understand where they're coming from. Be sympathetic to the business. Um, you don't, I like to think about it this way, if, if you've got an IT team, the organization needs to talk to the IT team because they need to get things done. They need servers built and they need, although cloud uh, also uh, makes that a problem as well but they also need to talk to the network team because they need to be able to open up the network to make their systems work that's how the organization works they need to talk to those two teams to get things done not often do they need to talk to the security staff or the security team uh, as a necessity to get business done they may do it because there's checks and balances but if that's not a pleasant thing, they'll find ways to get around it. If that's not a good way of doing it or they always have hurdles and it slows them down, then, it's, then they'll find ways around it. So this trust is paramount. You don't want to be the team who says, no, 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 you can't do that. It's against good practice. It's against how I see the world um, where, you know, that's not against good security. We wouldn't dare do that because what will happen is they'll bypass you. And even though you'll get to say, I told you so, when things go wrong, you've, they've had an, a, a problem, they've had an incident. And you may say, well, isn't that a good way for the organization to learn? Isn't that a good way for them to understand what they need to do? And maybe they'll listen to me now. It's not the way you want to achieve that, that, um, uh, that objective. What you want is them to have a good experience of dealing with security. Uh, you want them to come out of it. Uh, thinking, ah, we've uh, we've actually progressed here. We've been able to put this in, and we've done it in a safe manner. They've moved with us, and uh, we are doing it uh, confidently. You want the organisation to be a little bit uncomfortable if they're putting something in place without consulting the security team. And the only way that that will happen is if you have 
a large amount of trust. So I feel very strongly about this and I've seen it throughout the workplace uh, in many organizations that the uh, the effectiveness of the security team is, is uh, a measure of the trust they have with the organization. So I mentioned best practice. Don't just roll out best practice. Don't just roll out the, the standards. Don't just roll out the policies and say, you know, if someone asks, can we do this? Don't send them a full document. Ask them, what are you trying to achieve for your business? And what are you uh, hoping to um, get out of your new system or the new setting that you want to put in place? Um, how, what assets are involved? What risks might there be? How do you intend on using that? And go along the, with them on the journey. And that may sound like it's taking a lot of time, but every time you do that, you need to make a note and adjust processes and document how you've approached this particular uh, risk assessment. And then you will start to build up a good base of how these things are dealt with and you won't need to think about it too much next time. If you don't document and you don't uh, record what decisions you've made, you're constantly making those decisions again and reinventing the wheel or, or redoing the thought process. Uh, so we want to identify plausible risk. Uh, there are many possible risks, and some are more plausible than others, and this is the likelihood and impact question. We don't want to keep on calling out possible risks. If there's no point um, just saying that, that this is possible but highly, highly unlikely, um, it'll start getting very, very boring. So we just got to th have to think about plausible risks. Is it possible? Maybe. Many things are possible. Many things that are very unlikely are possible, but maybe they're not plausible. And that's finding that balance about uh, the, the likelihood of the, the risks. Uh, this is a bit more uh, on trust, but also uh, when you're dealing with people directly and with executives and with your uh, people, your, your peers, you should be building trust, also vision, and also relationship. Now, what I mean by that is the, the trust is the core of, of if they're going to come to you. They may not like you, but if they trust you, they'll still come to you. Vision is all about where you're going to go. So you may be dealing with a particular risk, but then you say, well, in the future, we plan to do it this way. So give them an idea of the, the situation now and what you could do in the future to address the risk in a more strategic fashion. And then you've got to work on the relationship uh, because that smooths everything over and makes work pleasant. And who wants to work in an unpleasant place or who wants to, who wants to uh, interact with an unpleasant person? Not, not many people. Finally, no fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh, it is, uh, you've, you've got to, if, if that's a practice that is currently occurring in your security team, you've got to stop doing it. This is um, where we hold the organization for ransom. We say, oh, well, this might happen or, oh, you know, that might happen. Uh, and they, you sowed the seeds of doubt. What we want to do is demystify security. We don't say it's a black box. It's only for people with especially large brains. It is for everyone. We just make it clear to everyone. We provide uh, truth and clarity to the business. We don't hold on to our secrets so that the business needs us. We provide it to the business in a clear and understandable manner so that we help the business. And in that way, we become uh, very valuable to the business. Okay. Sometimes it might not feel like that, but that's certainly uh, the way it works in a business that is interested in continuing to make money. All right, on to the next slide, and we're getting to the end of this live session. Uh, we are a little bit over time we do uh, account for a bit more um, there's a lot to pack into just four weeks so apologies if these go a bit closer to uh, 10 o'clock sometimes I hope to finish in um, you know probably the next seven minutes I'd say um, so stick in there um, and uh, stick around I know some some people uh, a few people have dropped off but there's a, still a very good attendance at the moment um, the threat scenarios, this is the key uh, of, uh, and you can have a look at the slide there. You can see the three items I've got there. One, two, three. These is the formula for explaining threats to the business, okay? And it's really important to understand this, this formula so that you can rattle off very quickly and understand very quickly how the business perceives cybersecurity risk. You may be a technical network expert. You may be a, an absolute guru with IT data, with databases and with, with uh, you know, um, 
uh, and, and an absolute Linux whiz. But if you don't know how to explain a risk in these terms, um, it, it, it becomes very difficult for the business to understand you. And they'll go somewhere else. And that's just the, the plain fact of the matter. Okay, so number one, you have an actor. You have a bad guy. You have a uh, – or an inadvertent good guy. You have uh, external or internal or you have instant, uh, incidental or malicious. So you will have a malicious external guy or a malicious external person. Uh, might be the case for a, a phishing attack. We'll, we'll do a few examples after this. So we have an actor. We have a negative impact. This is how the asset is exposed. Um, maybe there's unauthorized access. Uh, maybe loss of service, loss of data. Then we have an asset. We have a, either confidential information or the privileged function or business functionality, right? So we have an actor, negative impact, and an asset. All right, so those three things, actor, negative impact, and an asset. And this is how we put it together. Here's an example. So the vulnerability is, so threat scenarios come with vulnerability. So we, we're doing a risk assessment. We find a gap. We identify a vulnerability, and we say, what is the threat scenario that goes along with that, right? So vulnerability, this example is, for convenience, staff are storing corporate credit cards on or credit card numbers on Pastebin, right? Now, if you know Pastebin, Pastebin is like a, uh, a notepad in the internet that is uh, searchable, or not so searchable, but you're certainly easy to find stuff on. It's, there's no access control. You can just dump stuff up then. It is Pastebin, basically. You paste it onto that bin, and it's right there. So that's where often uh, usernames and passwords are dumped from breaches and stuff like that. So that's, uh, that's not a good place for staff to store corporate credit card numbers and Pastebin. What could possibly go wrong? So the threat scenario that we might attribute to this is an external attacker or an unauthorized external person may gain unauthorized access to the list of corporate credit card numbers, right? So we see here we have an external attacker where my cursor is. That is the actor. We have an unauthorized access. That is the negative impact. Unauthorized access is not good. And then we have corporate credit card numbers, which is our asset, all right? And that is a sentence that anyone can understand. An external attacker may gain unauthorized access to the list of corporate credit card numbers. You see how that is? We're not talking about, oh, explaining how Pastebin is, it's a site on the internet, you know, all that sort of stuff. We can cut straight to the chase and say, look, an, ex an, an external attacker may gain unauthorized access to our list of cre corporate credit card numbers. And the, and the business person will go, oi, 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 that's not good. How can that be? And then you can go into further, further detail. But that is the, the, the key to communicating cybersecurity risk to uh, an executive. Second example here, uh, it's a different sort of vulnerability, but there is this big delete all button right next to the update record button in a customer relationship manager application. <laughs> so we have someone who's putting in John Smith and he goes, John Smith, John Smith, and then he goes over and presses delete all instead of update record and the database is gone. How do we explain that threat to the executive? Well, you say a staff member may accidentally delete the full customer database. Here we have it again. We have a staff member, here's the actor. We have an, a, a negative impact accidental deletion and we have an asset the full customer database now you leave any of these elements out and you get you don't get a, a clear idea of the threat right you don't get a clear idea of the threat scenario if you add qualifying and, and they're very simple granted but if you add qualifying factors to this then it starts to get a bit more complex and you start to get that jaded look that you got at the barbecue with the executive right? They start to, you start to lose them. Uh, so it's important to keep it simple. And it may be an oversimplification in some cases, but this is as plain and simple as it gets to understand cybersecurity risk. Very important. Okay. Now, just to quickly touch on policies and standards, I have a way of doing policies and standards, which is kind of not uh, the industry standard, um, um, for want of a better word, but but this is how I structure them um, and I see them being easily understood in an organization. You basically have two types of documents that dictate security in the organization. First are policies, the second are standards. 
First, policies. You way well, you remember that policies are for people. Policy from the Greek, the population. Um, this is a high-level statement describing acceptable behaviour. It's supposed to educate uh, staff on how they are to behave. It's about behaviour. It's not about configuration settings. So if you've got a statement about how you want people to behave, don't choose bad passwords, don't choose the same passwords, or don't provide your password over email, or don't um, uh, don't uh, allow tailgating in the in the office. You know all those sorts of things. That's the policy. Policies are for people. Uh, and make it simple, obviously, uh, using our simple terminology, um, but also broad and uh, specific enough to address behavior. Then standards are for systems. They're more subject specific. They have specific statements describing how systems should be configured. Uh, they're non-vendor specific. You don't say, uh, this is a standard for Cisco systems. That's a different document. We've got those. Uh, we'll, I'll explain that in the next slide. Uh, but you have standards. You say networks are sub supposed to be configured this way and you and you have a non-vendor approach to it at a high level for for systems and these the audience for these are the uh, network guys the IT guys who are putting these systems in uh, you provide those to them and they use them as guidelines for how they architect and put together their systems some examples there for security policies there's information security policy information classification policy also acceptable use policy this is again dictating how people behave examples of baseline uh, sorry standards are network security standards and encryption standards they're subject specific the other two documents that you'll have uh, types of documents are baselines these are technology and vendor specific uh, documents. This is how you configure a Windows 7 system. This is how you configure uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux of this particular version. And it's a technical configuration. It's a baseline. And it is dictated by the standard that is non-vendor specific because you have uh, high level statements in there of how the system must uh, be configured. And then you have a baseline for doing that. Finally, plans are what to do when a specific issue occurs. A cybersecurity issue contains responsibilities and contacts and a step-by-step -step process in how to deal with uh, a, a particular issue, uh, likely incident response plan or business continuity plan. The one we'll be covering in more depth is the incident response plan. All right, we're coming to the end of it. Good on you all for holding in there. We have just this last slide now. Uh, which is an introduction now to the next three weeks. This is the cybersecurity practice as I see it. Uh, this is what we do as a cybersecurity team dealing with cybersecurity in the organization. These are the functions. This one up here, the darker orange, is what the cybersecurity manager does. He also does all the rest if he doesn't have the team to do it. But if he has the team to fill out these other functions down here, he is, uh, he is focusing on these. This governance is managing upwards, providing information and receiving direction from the executive team and the, and the, the board. This here uh, is management. This is making sure that you've got the skills and resources in your team uh, and developing people and that you have awareness in the organization and you have the policies that dictate how we um, perform or what we gauge the organization by in these areas down below. On the left here, we have the Warriors. This is a lovely sensational name for security technology operations, <laughs> for technical operation people. These are the, the, the technical whiz, uh, or the, 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 the guys who really know how to script and, and, and uh, get to the core of a technical issue. Uh, they may sometimes not be well suited to talking to the business, but they serve a very important function in, in uh, doing security testing, monitoring and incident response and investigation. So these are the warriors. These are the guys who dive in there and actually hand hand combat with the technical issues. The critics, these are the guys who review, often called auditors, but they're review and compliance. They actually check systems or, or designs and review it against a standard and a set of requirements. They also audit against various standards and, and again, they make sure that PCI, ISO and COBIT requirements are being satisfied. The visionaries are those guys who are th thinking forward. They're thinking of the next 
control or the controls they're currently putting in place to address risks in the business. They are putting in strategy and architecture uh, to ensure that, that the business stays safe in the future. They have network controls, IT controls, and they wrap all that up in a security program. We'll be covering warriors and critics next week. We'll be covering visionaries and leaders the week after. Uh, and these are all the people that make up your cybersecurity team uh, and, uh, and, and really, uh, I guess, a good way of looking at the, the practice as a whole. If you go from this side, the warrior side, over to the visionary side, and if there was an arrow pointing to the right, which I'll put on in, uh, which I'll show, I've got a diagram of that uh, next week, you will see that it becomes more strategic this way and more tactical back this way. So more reactive over here and more proactive over here. And here we have uh, both, you know, both proactive and reactive and, and uh, reviewing um, uh, systems in place. So that's it. That's the first week. Um, we have covered off a fair amount. I've gotten onto the soapbox about four or five times. Uh, we might have uh, five minutes for a couple of questions, uh, Margie, to try and uh, not catch you off guard this time. Um, <laughs> there is one. Uh, yep. So, um, so what I'll do is um, anyone who has any questions, please feel free to post them right now. Um, but what I'll do is I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. Um, so Yusuf um, asks, uh, what's more important, threat or vulnerability in terms of determining a risk rating and the level of risk to the organization? Uh, threat or vulnerability. Um, uh, I think they go hand in hand, and that's not really a, a, you know, a, an answer. But you, obviously you identify a vulnerability, but at that stage you don't really know if the vulnerability is an actual threat to the organization. So it is a, a process. You, you, you find the vulnerability, and then you work out how uh, the likelihood and impact of that vulnerability being exploited. And that's the process of working out the threat. So then you would say that the threat is, is how, uh, how much impact and how likely it is uh, and what would happen if that vulnerability was exploited. So, uh, so in that way, they, they kind of go hand in hand, but ultimately you're aiming to figure out what the threat is. So that's the idea of the threat scenario. You work out the vulnerability and you uh, use your de deductive skills and knowledge of the, uh, the organization to work out the threat scenario and provide a, a plausible threat scenario. Uh, that answer, uh, yep. Yusuf. Um, can you please uh, elaborate on an example of um, FUD? Oh, FUD, yeah. Uh, yeah, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, I hope I made that clear. But but that's what FUD stands for, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, I thought that was only a security, like an internal term for security guys, but I once had someone in the IT team say, oh, you're just going to provide me a whole lot of FUD now, aren't you? And, uh, and I tried not to be offended by that, but, uh, but he's got a good point. A lot of times there is uh, security teams just uh, blurt out, uh, you know, a, a, uh, a possible threat, but that may not actually occur. Um, an example of this, I'm trying to think of it. Um, all right, so, so maybe we think about, you know, 12 character passwords or something like that. And the security team might say, look, if you don't have 12 character passwords, uh, it's possible that someone will come up with a new way to reverse the hashing encryption. Um, anything less than that is just not good practice. And, and, other, and, and other organizations do it this way, uh, you know, and things like that. Those speculative comments that might drive fear into uh, an, an executive or, a, or another uh, person to try and drive them into doing better security practice. What we're really looking for is to provide clarity there, not to provide fear or not to drive uncertainty into the conversation. The, the security, the cybersecurity team is there to uh, understand the risk, understand the asset and to provide a good explanation to the organization so they can make an appropriate um, uh, decision. A decision made on fear and uncertainty and a little bit of mixed in doubt is unlikely to give you a good outcome. And we see this with knee-jerk reactions when there's uh, a big issue. Uh, sometimes they will, uh, you know, there, there will be 
too much security put in. You know, we'll put a VPN in front of another VPN in front of another VPN. So you've got three levels of going into a system. And that just doesn't address a risk. It doesn't. You, you may have three stages of authentication with different passwords. You're just making it hard for the users to get in. So, uh, so it's important to keep uncertainty and doubt. That's why we're there to investigate, to understand, and to provide that clarity. I hope that, that answers the question. You're going to get me on the soapbox again. <laughs> um, oh, there was a really good question and then I lost it. Um, sorry, one moment. I'm just having yeah, a quick okay. look. Um, wh Robert asked, "What do you have any? Um, sorry, what is the recommended process and guideline that um, people should use when they're writing reports and communicating with the executive team for for cybersecurity threats? Yeah. Um, can you briefly go over that, or can you can you say that one again?" Um, what is the recommended process and guidelines that um, uh, cybersecurity managers should use in writing reports when they're communicating um, with executives? Yeah, okay. Um, other than the points that I provided uh, above, which is you know being succinct and clear um, pretty much and, and refining your writing and, and verbal communication as much as possible. So if that means communication courses and things like that, that's that's certainly, and I, and I believe the IT Masters includes a very good communication course now, um, which I would highly encourage anyone to uh, have a look at um, if they were taking that, that um, course. Um, uh, there is, the, so one, uh, one framework that I think is very valuable is the, the COVID-5 framework for uh, um, the goals cascade. Um, so have a look into that if, if you're, um, Robert, if you're asking, um, there is, uh, yeah, the, the goals cascade in COVID-5 allows you to um, boil down uh, some of the concerns that, that uh, security uh, might have, like direct technical concerns, and boil them down to business objectives uh, and concerns that the executives might have. So uh, that's a it's a good example, and it's and COVID five for for a larger IT uh, base, and it's there's a lot to it, and and it's um maybe uh, you know it's a good governance framework for enterprise IT, uh, but taking a few elements out of that will allow you to speak directly into the concerns of the uh, the IT executive. So I would suggest that if you're looking for something quite uh, prescriptive. That's a good way of doing it. it the, the way that COVID-5 does it is it puts very plain kind of uh, business objectives into IT objectives and then into kind of uh, metrics and it allows you to, to talk up. And I'll be talking about metrics in the, in the, the fourth um, live session, the fourth webinar as well. I hope that answered the question. Um, so uh, Jay asks um, if the source code is everything, um, software-wise, if someone had access or has gained unauthorized access to your source code, can they exploit it and make vulnerabilities and threats? Um, if so, how can this be prevented? Yeah, well, it's not. Um, uh, so firstly, I'll an uh, answer the first question. Um, it's not naturally that if someone has your source code, then they will naturally be able to make vulnerabilities and, and or identify vulnerabilities and make exploits. You look at all the open source software in the world, uh, there is obviously a lot of vulnerabilities and exploits written for those, but they're generally closed off and uh, re new ones reopen in a different version later on. You know, it's, it's kind of a changing landscape, but it doesn't mean that naturally uh, you would find vulnerabilities. Um, uh, it's highly unlikely that it will be free from vulnerabilities that we know because that's the nature of software. It's, it's written by humans and they make mistakes. Uh, there are things that can be put in place to, you know, if you go through umpteen code reviews and, and static analysis and dynamic analysis of the code, uh, you can reduce the, the likelihood of that. But a lot of big organizations use, I mean, just about every big organization uses open source software to fulfill business needs, and it has a place. Um, uh, I think the, the um, you know, the commercial systems, they rely on the source being closed so that the vulnerabilities aren't as easily found. But it's just a different way of finding them. They use fuzzes instead and they, they, um, they try uh, different parameters and, and, 
and and they are found in different ways and different configuration uh, ways. So uh, I think not you don't naturally find vulnerabilities in source code because you have the source code. It depends on the quality of the source code. It's highly unlikely it won't have any vulnerabilities. Doesn't mean you'll find them all. Um, and to reduce this, you need to test, 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 and test at every stage of your development cycle. Uh, and then finally, if you are developing and you are not developing open source, you make sure you have good security around your source code so that it doesn't get uh, open to unauthorized users. I got that one. Uh, yeah. Um, one last Do we one. have time for one more question? Uh, yeah. We're just on 10 o'clock. We'll do one more and then we'll close it up. Yeah. Um, so Rowan asks, what areas of cybersecurity are organizations ignoring the most currently? <laughs> ah, wow. Um, I'll answer this by uh, describing the, and you can see, um, you can see evidence of this in the attacks and the incidents that occur. Uh, I think uh, three main areas that need attention at the moment is one, uh, still websites and internet accessible systems. Two, phishing of customers and awareness, sorry, of staff and awareness of uh, cybersecurity issues and how to pr uh, practice good cybersecurity. And three, um, uh, partners, partners who are not, uh, uh, who have access to your environment and who are not uh, operating in a secure manner as well. So um, those three, those three uh, things, uh, I would say, are uh, not so much being neglected. I think they've got a high amount of visibility, but they're certainly the things that seem to be the most lax at the moment or be, have the most avenues into an organization. I hope that answered the question. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, no problems. We've got, uh, so these are the discussion questions that we'll put on um, the, uh, the forum. Um, and I'll send them to you, Margie, if that's all right. And, and We'll put them on, or I might I might just post them myself. Uh, and uh, I thank everyone for staying in there. We we kept pretty much everyone interested for almost an hour and a half, which is a big call. So thank you everyone, uh, and uh, appreciate it. And we'll see you uh, next week. Uh, Margie, is there anything else we have to do to close off the the webinar from your perspective? Um, no, that's pretty much it. Um, students who aren't sure of what, where the forums are, just log in to learn.itmasters.edu.au and go to the Cybersecurity Management um, uh, site. Um, and if you just scroll down, you'll be able to see the forum there. Terrific. Thanks, but, yeah, That's pretty much it. Great. Thank you, Jeremy.